This is going to be Psalm 23. And we're going to talk about the shepherd's never-ending story. As a young kid, I saw a movie called The Never-Ending Story. And later, as a young Christian, I realized they stole the plot from the Bible. Because Jesus Christ is the true never-ending story. You couldn't even find the first page because there isn't a beginning. In John twenty one twenty five, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. In Revelation twenty two thirteen, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The Bible says itself that if everything was wrote down that Jesus did, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. You see, Psalm 23 is the shepherd's psalm. So let's talk about the shepherd's never-ending story. In Psalm 23, 1, it says, A psalm of David, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So David believes the Lord is his shepherd and that he is all he needs. So he says, I shall not want. So the Lord has a never-ending story with his, the first thing, bottomless shepherd's bag. Just when you thought he ran out, he pulls out something else. And you used to think that your mom's purse was like that, but it's nothing compared to what the Lord has in storage. An innumerable company of angels couldn't keep up with what he has in his bag. In 1 Samuel seventeen forty, it says, referring to David, and he took his staff in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So that verse is about David, who just so happens to be a type of Jesus Christ, loading up five smooth stones in his shepherd's bag. For any enemy, the Lord has smooth stones to pull out, just like he did on Goliath. He just wants you to reach in there and get them. You can expect enemies. The world hates a Christian who acts like a Christian. And in the Bible, Egypt is a type of, of the world. In Genesis forty six thirty four, it shows you the Egyptians considered it an abomination to eat with shepherds. So the world obviously wants nothing to do with the true shepherd, the Lord Jesus. But just when you think that you're at the end of your road, he pulls something else out of his bag. It's a never-ending supply. That's why the Bible says he'll supply all your needs. Everything you need. So, the, ne the never-ending story of the shepherd, he has a bottomless shepherd's bag. And the next thing, his bridge keeps going. There is a cool picture I saw once that shows a cross being used as a bridge to get across from hell to heaven. Now, this is true because he made peace by the blood of his cross and the bridge keeps going after salvation. Many times you think, oh, it stops. You know, it keeps going. Jesus Christ is the way of salvation and also your ticket into being a part of the never-ending story yourself. In Psalm 23, 2 and 3, it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So he laid out the bridge. As the shepherd, he knows where to lead you. He doesn't lead you down the way of a transgressor. He leads you in the paths of righteousness. That's where the bridge will take you. He doesn't lead you to the house of the strange woman whose steps take hold on hell. He preaches the straight and narrow way. He wants you on the path of righteousness. And as a New Testament believer, you do this by walking in the Spirit. You need to do it for His name's sake. It says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. So he does it for his name's sake. For one thing, you never want to bring shame to the name of the shepherd 
by forsaking the path of righteousness for the way of sinners. If you're not going to live right, if you don't feel like you have any motivation to live right, at least do it for his name's sake. In Psalm 23, 2, it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. In the millennium, the Lord will have Israel lie down. And this has to do with them being at peace and without fear. In Leviticus 26, 5 and 6, it says, And your threshing shall reach into the vintage, and the vintage shall reach into the sowing time. And ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. So he says, I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. If a man is lying down, then this means he is at peace. He's at rest, and he's not afraid. In Proverbs 3.24, when thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. God isn't done with Israel. At the end of the tribulation, they will get their land promised to their fathers, and they will lie down peacefully. In Ezekiel 34, 13 through 15, it says, And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. And I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. There's that lie down again. In the tribulation, all green grass gets burned up, as you know if you've read Revelation 7:17. 7, and then at the second coming, the Lord comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance. So that grass is burned up. However, the same Lord that can destroy as much of his creation as he wants to can also restore it. So he also makes us to lie down in green pastures. In the millennium, all that grass is restored. He's going to restore everything. And me and you, he makes us to lie down in green pastures. When it comes to being saved or being lost, the grass really is greener on the other side. That is, on the bright side. The devil's yard is all grown up with a bunch of trees and shady spots because the wicked like to be snakes in the grass. But when you take the bridge, the shepherd's bridge that keeps going and walk on the light as he is in the light, you'll see that the grass is greener over here on the bright side. It's good enough to eat. The sheep eat where they sleep in the green pastures. If you have a King James Bible, that should be where you eat and where you sleep. Have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then listen to Scorby when you go to bed. You eat and sleep it. This is where he leadeth me beside the still waters with the washing of water by the word. And in the tribulation time period, he will preserve a faithful Jewish remnant and lead them beside still waters. He will suck up those waves that the devil shoots out of his mouth in Revelation 12. He'll lead them beside the still waters. In Psalm 23, 3, it says, He restoreth my soul. Doctrinally, Psalm 23 would be about the nation of Israel being restored at the end of the tribulation. In, Rebel, in Romans 11, 25 through 26, it says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So right there, you have them called Israel, Zion, and Jacob. And it says, and so all Israel shall be saved. If that's just referring to the church, why does it say all Israel shall be saved? If you are a Christian, you're already saved. This is obviously referring to a future restoration of the nation of Israel. The shepherd's never-ending story has a bridge 
that keeps going. He has a bottomless shepherd's bag that never runs out. And his story is never ending because he has been there and done that. That's the next thing. Have you ever been around someone who has done it all and you say something you did and they already did it years ago and did it even better than you did? Well, the Lord done did everything an eternity ago and did it better than they did. The, sh the shepherd is such a good shepherd because he lived as a sheep himself. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You can't trick the Lord and say life is too hard because... He's been there and done that. He lived a sinless life and faced death. He looked death in the eye and resurrected. He already walked through the valley of the shadow of death and was the only one to make it out alive. And since you're on the bridge, you're the next to make it out alive yourself. But the chief shepherd guards the saints and will pull you out of the mouth of the lion. In Amos 3.12, it says, Thus saith the Lord, As the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs, or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and in Damascus in a couch. So the chief shepherd guards the saints, the saints from all ages. He literally lays down his life for the sheep. He came down, took on the likeness of sinful flesh, he was God manifested in the flesh. He is God manifest in flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, believed on in the world, received up into glory. In John ten eleven, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When you walk through death, it isn't a fearful thing because the shepherd has been there, done that. In 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty four through 56, it says, So when this corruptible shall, put on in, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep, but he rose again. In Hebrews thirteen twenty, it says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So our shepherd used his rod and he grabbed death by the neck and laughed in his face. And he thought that sickle he was holding looked like something you would buy from the Dollar Tree. It didn't look sharp to him. It looked like it would break before you got it out of the package. But the good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. He rose again after he went through the valley of death himself and he's coming back again for the sheep. In 1 Peter 5, 4, it says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So why should we, you fear? All this world and the people in it can do is kill the body. And if you're like Paul, then you have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better anyhow. The Lord is my shepherd, and he has a rod and a staff. It can work more miracles than Moses and Aaron's rods. The magicians wouldn't stand a chance. Their wand is just a counterfeit. In Psalm 23, 4, it says, Yea, though, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Just like the Lord was with the children of Israel in a pillar of a cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night, just like he's with us today. He's in us and we're in him. Just like he's going to be with Israel in the, in the tribulation and drop down manna from heaven for, for him again. The rod is not only a weapon against wolves and lions and tigers and bears. It is also to chasten the sheep. He does this to make the sheep wiser. In Proverbs twenty nine fifteen, it says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother, mother to shame. Proverbs twenty two fifteen, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So it's to get that foolishness out of you. That's where you get to saying he knocked a fool out of him. In Proverbs twenty three thirteen, Without 
or it says, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. You got to knock some sense into some people. In Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The shepherd loves the sheep, and that's why you're chastened with his rod. In Hebrews 12, 6 through 8, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Sometimes the shepherd must use the rod on the sheep. Sometimes the rod is actually the enemy. Remember how Moses had a rod and it turned into a serpent? Sometimes the rod of God is the serpent. Sometimes men are turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, and the enemy becomes the rod of God that is used to chasten the sheep. For example, in Isaiah 10, 5, it says, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Sometimes the enemy is the rod. The devil himself is used as a puppet, as a disciplining tool to the sheep. Consider Job. Now, this valley of the shadow of death, back to it, it also refers to something in the tribulation, something the eye will be able to see. This isn't far-fetched if you consider how death and hell are personified in Revelation 6. Revelation 6, 8, it says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. The shadow of death is associated with many negative things in the Bible. In Job 3, 5, it's associated with darkness and blackness. In Job 10, 21, it's associated with the land of darkness. In Job 34, 22, it's associated with the workers of iniquity who are associated with the mystery of iniquity, the Antichrist. In Psalm 44, 19, it's associated with dragons. In Psalm 107, 10, associated with affliction and iron. Some Bible believers teach it's some type of iron death machine or mothership-like thing that covers over the land and forms a shadow killing anybody that goes under it. Something like what you might see on Independence Day. This thing would be associated with the idle shepherd who's associated with iron mixed with miry clay. Not associated with the chief shepherd. So, though I walk for the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. There's going to be protection there for the saints. And I'm not sure what the shadow of death is completely, but I believe there's something there, something that you'll visibly be able to see. There's going to be a real shadow there. The shepherd has a never-ending story, and he has a bottomless shepherd's bag. He has a bridge that keeps going, and he has a book that feeds innumerable saints. Think about all the saints through the years who have read the Bible over and over, but never get tired of it. Jesus fed the 5,000, but he feeds even more than that with one book that has stood the test of time. And it says in Psalm 23, 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Oil, a picture of the Holy Spirit. My cup runneth over. Every born-again believer is sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. And Paul calls us anointed. And if your cup runs over, then you have all that you need. You have all you need. The shepherd fills your plate and your cup. In the millennium, the Lord will be exalted in the presence of his enemies. Israel will dwell in safety. The chief shepherd is going to feed them. In Isaiah 40, 10 through 11, it says, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall roll for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. 
Psalm 23, 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. What is at the table that God has prepared for you? Right now. Right now you're in the presence of your enemies. You're in the world. You are around the flesh, the world, and the devil. And he's prepared a table for you. Now, this ain't the marriage supper of the Lamb yet. Because that's not in the presence of your enemies. But down here, you're eating in the presence of your enemies. What has he prepared on the table for you? Well, in Proverbs 25, 11, it says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. So, you got some apples. In Psalm 119, 103, it says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So, there's your honey. 1 Peter 2, 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. There's some milk in your cup, and it's running over. And Luke 4, 4, it says, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. There's your bread that maybe they bring it out first. And if, if Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. There's your water. In Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and mercy will follow the saints because these are attributes of the shepherd, and he's going to rub off on you. You're going to have some goodness and mercy. You go wherever he goes, and he goes wherever you go. The house of the Lord is prophetically the tabernacle on earth that shows up in the millennium. Today, your body is the temple. He's not dwelling in temples made with hands right now. The Holy Ghost is in you. But David says, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So this was the story, the never-ending story of the never-ending shepherd. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will become a part of the never-ending story. And you'll get to get to go on the bridge that keeps going. 